thank God, amen, for Jesus Christ. Third John. Oh, what a Savior. Mm -mm. The Lord's good, ain't he? Life-changing God, amen. Amen. Third John. You know, sometimes we need to ask ourselves some questions, like Brother D'Angelo said this morning, amen. Questions are good. We need to begin to help us maybe slow down a little bit and think, see what the Lord's doing, amen. But you ever, every once in a while, we maybe need to kind of be reminded or ask ourselves why we come to church. I mean, why are we here today? You know, sometimes if we're not careful, we get in a little ritual, and, you know, some kind of your structure in your life is always is good. It can help your life. But sometimes you get so structural and just so routine-ish about doing things that we forget why we do them. Right. Amen. Why are we here today? Why are you here today? Why are you sitting in that pew? You say, well, Mom and Daddy made me. Well, that's a good thing Mom and Daddy got to get you where you need to be, maybe hear from God. But you need to ask yourself, even as a young child, why am I here? Why didn't my Mom and Daddy ask me to come? Why did they make me come? Amen. Why did they uh, the demand out of my life this is where I need to be? And why did I get up this morning, get ready, and come to this place this, this day? Amen. I believe we ought to be able to answer with number one, amen, I came to worship God. Amen. It's just a reasonable thing to do. God gave me breath, gave me life, and I came to worship Him, give Him praise, because He's worthy, amen. And we're to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. It's what God expects out of us. That's why we came, amen. Have you ever asked, you answer that question, I really came today because I needed to hear from God. I need God to give me some instruction about my life. Amen. I, I'm coming to worship Him, to please Him, to honor Him, to fellowship with my brothers and sisters in Christ. But you know what? I need to hear from heaven. And I'm glad to report God still speaks through the Word of God. We can come worship Him, we can come fellowship with one another, but we can come hear something from this book that could give me some direction in the life that I'm living today. So look in 3 John. Let's read the chapter, very short chapter here. Short book, it's just one chapter long, 14 verses. And the Bible says that John writing here by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost in verse 1, the elder unto the well-beloved Gaius. So John being the elder at this time, aged in his life, and he's writing to his friend Gaius. The Bible said, whom I love in the truth. Boy, there's something about aging and getting older to kind of give you a little bit more uh, better outlook on life, ain't it? Better outlook on what we're doing for the Lord. He said, Beloved, John writing to Gaius, he's his beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. John reflecting on his friend Gaius here that apparently has some kind of health issues. And boy, if time tarries and the Lord tarries, boy, we all going to come to that point probably where we have some health issues. And you wish that things would be better for others. Me and my wife went by and seen Miss Shelby yesterday. And boy, she's in good spirits. Thank God for that. And she's had that surgery, healing up with her hip and going and getting a little bit better as days go on. But you know, you wish that when you see your brothers and sisters in Christ, that as their soul prospers, Brother Preach taught a great message on that body, soul, and spirit this morning, hey, that your body also would prosper, that you'd be in health. Amen. It's a desire. You like to see people in good health so they can go out and do the things that they need to do. And, Please the Lord with their bodies. And we ought to please Him in with our body, soul, and spirit, haven't we? Amen. Every bit of it belongs to Him. So his brother here is in some bad health issues. He says, verse 3, For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. He said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, 
which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. Because that for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles, we therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers of the truth. John's just bragging on Gaius, has a desire to see his help uh, uh, prosper, and uh, he speaks about the joy that he has in his heart, that he's walking in truth and, and, and serving the Lord. And then he kind of shifts gears and he says to John, uh, Gaius in this letter, I wrote into the church, well, John had a love for the church. We ought to have a love for the church. He says, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. He's letting Gaius know that, hey, there's a brother in the church that's kind of a little bit unruly, a little bit of selfishness in, in his life. He wants the preeminence. He wants the attention instead of God receiving the attention. He says, John said about this brother, he said, Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malice words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. There's a brethren in the church that's kind of a little bit unruly, wicked individual, He's against the truth and against what's going on. You know, it's a bad way when anybody gets sideways with the church. Ain't a good thing to get sideways with the church. Amen. God loved the church. And I know the church, the body of Christ and the local assembly, two different entities in themselves. But, hey, boy, they kind of go co uh, coincide with a lot of ways. And, man, you get out uh, sideways with the believers, the body of Christ, the church, in a bad way. But if you get sideways with the local church where God is on and we meet to worship the Lord, man, you're in, you're in a bad company, you're in a bad way. You know what the devil would like to get you, how the devil would like to get you? He'd like to get you sideways with the local church. Get you sideways with the man of God and get you sideways with the uh, brother and amen and uh, cause divisions amongst the body. And boy, that's a bad way to get. And this old brother, he's kind of sideways with the church. And you know what John said? I'm kind of sideways with him. He said, when I come, I'll remember his deed. And I believe every once in a while, the man of God, the people of God, are to get sideways with people that sideways with the church. And say, hey, man, we ain't for that. And we got a problem with you, you got a problem with us. And nothing wrong with that, amen. There's a little bit wrong with it. It is the kind of limp wrist society we live in, but preachers are bygone, amen. He wasn't afraid to let people know, man, you sideways with the church, we sideways with you. You got a problem with the worship place, amen. We got a problem with you. Oh, come down at my house where I live and get to have a problem with my home. We go, I'm going to have a problem with you. And if you come down to where I worship and got a problem with my church, I'm going to have a problem with you. You got a problem with my preacher, you got a problem with me. You got a problem with my brothers and sisters in Christ, I got problems with you. Well, sideways with him. He said, I'm going to remember his deeds. And he said, I'm going to let him know to his face when I see him. Uh, Paul done it to P even Peter. Remember down there at the book of, in the book of Galatians, down at Galatia, he said, hey, man, I, I, I went right to his face and let him know, hey, man, you got some problems. You're causing divisions in the church. He says, he goes on to say, John says, John's just, <laughs> he's, he's the well-beloved, he's the elder. Now you think he might be meddling out a little bit, man. He's just as stern, <laughs> maybe a little stern. And he loved, John loved. He's the, uh, the, the beloved disciple, amen, and he loved the Lord and laid his head on the breast of the Lord. But hey, at the same time, he said, I love, but I know how to get a little gritty when I need to get gritty too. And we need a balance like that. We need love for others. Man, we losing the love, ain't we? And we get a little bit too uh, bitter and hateful, amen. That's the spirit of Diotrephes. That's not the spirit of God's children. But at the same time you love, you ought to have some things you hate in this whole life. He said, Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil have not seen God. Then he says another brother, Demetrius had the good report of all men, and of the truth itself. Yea, 
And we also bear record, and ye know that our record is true. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee. But I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be, un, uh, be to thee, our friends. Salute thee. Greet the friends by name. Let's pray. Brother Ted, how about pray for us, brother? When John, by the inspiration of God, wrote to his beloved friend here, John began to discuss the issues at the church where they attended. There are two different testimonies that are given in this little short book. One testimony of those that helped the church, and then another testimony of those that hurt the church. Do you know, everybody here today, you either help the church or you hurt the church. It's the testimony that's given by John about these individuals here. I want to preach on this thought this morning. What is your testimony? What is your testimony? You know, you say, what is a testimony? Well, that's an evidence of facts of our lives. Somebody said, you know, a while back they said, I don't know whoever coined it to begin with, but they said that if you was on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian? But there be enough testimony given on your behalf to accuse you of being a child of God. You know, when it comes to our lives, we all have a testimony. And our testimony could either help the church or hurt the church. When John wrote here to Gaius and he began to discuss the issues in the church, there was one here that helped the church. There's a testimony of those that done what was right. The Bible says in verse number 3, he says, For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came, look at this, and testified of the truth that is in thee. There was a testimony of your truth in your life that is in thee even as thou walkest in the truth. And John said, hey, guys, when they came and showed me testimony of your life, I rejoiced that your testimony was a pure testimony. Gaius had a testimony that was right. Not only did Gaius have a testimony that was right, but D, uh, Demetrius did. Look down in verse 12. Demetrius have a good report of all men. Uh, the brethren testified in verse 3 that Gaius walked in truth, and all men testified that Demetrius was a guy uh, that had a good report in his life. Amen. Hey, when people begin to think about your life, kind of like when they think about uh, Gaius, uh, John said, man, all I think about is what the brethren said, how you walk in truth and you do what's right. And the all men came and began to speak about Dem Demetrius in the church. Hey, thank God there's some good people in the church. Amen. Hey, to do the right thing, that walk the right path, to stay away from wickedness, amen. Hey, when you begin to think about these individuals and their testimony in the church, you know what you see about them? That they, number one, they had a love for the book. Hey, man, our testimonies ought to reflect that we've got a love for the Word of God. Hey, hey, you know how some of you are here this morning? It's because you love this book right here. Hey, man, thank God for the words of God. Man, I love the Word of God. I want to hear it preached, I want to hear it taught, I want to see it open, I want to read it, I want to let it speak to my heart. There's a love for the Word of God. There had to be a love for the Word of God that brings you down to church, amen. You're not here, you know, just to fellowship and just to see one another or maybe eat another meal, but man, we want to hear something out of that book. I want to see the book open, I want to hear it during devotion time, I want to hear it during Sunday school time, I want it during preaching, I want the Word of God open, because it speaks to my heart, amen. You know what he said about guys? That old boy loved the word of God. He loved the truth. Look in verse number one. The elder unto the well-beloved guys whom I love in the truth. That boy loves the truth, and I love him in the truth. He said in verse number three, in the end of that verse, even as thou walkest in the truth. Amen. There was something about the truth that they love. And the truth we know is the word of God. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth, John 17, 17. There's something about the love of the Word of God. 
It brings people down to worship the Lord. Amen. He said in verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Hey, their testimony was that they loved the book. Amen. Hey, can't get enough of the Word of God. Hey, just love to hear it preached, love to hear it taught, love to hear it read. Hey, just something about God's book. Amen. That's a testimony to have that we love the book. It's pretty bad when we don't love the book. We don't pay attention to it read. We don't pay attention to it preach. We're kind of just, you know, going through the motions, and we don't care whether the book's open. Hey, man, I love this book, man. He said in verse 8, We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers of the truth. It was a love for the truth. It was truth itself that was spoken of in verse 12 about Demetrius, amen. A good report of the truth. Them boys loved the book. Hey, you know what? Not, not only did they love the book, the testimony on this side, they loved the book, but they loved the brethren. I mean, they care for God's people. Man, you ought to love God's people. And I know sometimes we as God's people, and I say we, we're not what we ought to be, and sometimes we say things we shouldn't say and do things we shouldn't do, and it kind of, you know, uh, causes a little friction among the brother and amen, and, and which ought not to be so, but it happens, you know what, but hey, deep down in our hearts, we're to just love God's people. I mean, thank God for God's people, amen. He said in verse number two, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in hell. Hey, hey, Gaius loved God's people, amen. He not only loved the book, but his love to the book flowed over in his love for the brethren. Hey, and John had a love for the brethren, and he loved Gaius and wanted to see him prosper. Hey, you are to love God's people, amen. You ought to be touched with their uh, infirmities and touched with their sicknesses, amen. It ought, to, uh, it ought to cause something inside of you. You want to pray for them, that God will bless them and take care of them, as we said about Miss Shelby and others that are going through things. Hey, hey, do we have a love to see them get better? Amen. They, that's a testimony to have. You ought to have a testimony that you're just so hateful and you hate everybody. Nobody wants to be around you. I'm talking about a testimony that we love the truth and we love the book and we love the brother and amen. Hey, you get sideways with the book, you're going to get sideways with the brother. They love the brother. They had a testimony that they love the brother. He said in verse 3, I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth. I mean, it was the brethren that came and told John about Gaius. It was the brethren that he loved. In verse number 5, he said, Beloved, uh, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and the strangers. I mean, they loved the brethren. Verse 6, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church. They had a charity, a love, a giving love towards the church. That's why they loved the brethren and they loved the book. Amen. That's a testimony to have. I mean, do you know if somebody looks at you and says, Hey, you know what? That brother right there, that sister right there, they loved the book. And they love the brother. Not only do we see their testimony that they love the book and they love the brother, but they love the blessed hope. The hope that a sinner could be saved. The hope that Jesus was coming again. You've heard that old saying, the book, the blood, the blood and the blessed hope. But what about the book and the uh, brother and the blessed hope? Hey, that's what we ought to all love. Hey, we love this book, man. It changed our lives. We love the brethren because they've been so good to us and they help us along life's journey. But we love the hope of the blessed hope of Jesus coming again, amen. And some other sinner being saved. Hey, we're to come with the expectation that, hey, today might be the day somebody walks the aisle, somebody comes to know the Lord, somebody's life's changed because that's what God does in church. Well, the book's open and the love of the brethren is there and the blessed hope that somebody's life can be changed. Look in verse 6. He said, Which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey at their godly sort, thou shalt do well. Thou bringing the brethren forth, they're helping the missionaries go, because that for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles. We ought to receive such that might be fellow helpers in the truth. Hey, we can get the gospel around the world. Hey, we can get it through the mission program. We can get it through our track distribution at church, our, our local witness to others, amen. It's just something about people coming to know the Lord. What a testimony that Gaius had and Demetrius had and the brothers of the church there. Man, they were on fire for God. They were preaching the word of God and people were in love with one another and people were trying to get the gospel around the world. That's a testimony a church ought to have. But on the other hand, when John writes here, he gives the description of another testimony. And it's not as great. Amen. When it came to Gaius and it came to Demetrius and it came to the others in the church, this is what their lives were all about. 
It was just about promoting that book and promoting the brethren and helping one another and getting the gospel around the world. And then you have Diotrephes. It's like any time the Lord's doing a work and having something done, there's always some type of a devil. I mean, even in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he chose his apostles out, and one of them was a devil. I mean, in the work of the Lord, there was a devil. I mean, you always have devils in church. You always have uh, people that don't do it right. And the truth be told, amen, sometimes even us are like Gaius and Demetrius, we act like devils. But there's a testimony here that is very bad. When it, came, when it comes to Diotrephes, it ain't about the blessed hope, and it ain't about the book, and it ain't about the brother. You know who it's about? It's about himself. What a stinking testimony to have. Do you know what's wrong with a lot of people in their lives when they get sideways with the church and sideways with the brethren and don't want to hear the book preach? You know what their problem is? They got a problem with themselves. The Bible said in verse 9, I wrote unto the church. I mean, he wrote to the church. What's going on at the church? He said, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Diotrephes didn't care about the church, and he didn't care about the blessed hope, and he didn't care about the book. All he cared about was himself. He wanted the preeminence. He wanted to be the one. Amen. It's all about himself. He promotes himself and not Christ or the church. It's just all about what he can do. And that spirit of 2 Timothy chapter number 3, that spirit of selfishness has overflooded his life. More what a testimony to me that if it ain't about you, it doesn't matter. If you don't get the attention and you don't get the singing, you don't get the preaching, you don't get the mention behind the pulpit, you get sideways with the church because it's got to be about you. Nobody patted me on the back. Nobody allowed me to do a thing. So I'll take my ball and go somewhere else. A lot of times they don't take their ball and go somewhere else until they tear something else up first. It would have been good for the, uh, Diotrephes if he had a problem, just go ahead and hit the road if you ain't going to get right. The good thing is that we want you to get right. We want you to serve the Lord. But when you get selfish, you get in a bad way. You know what happens when you get selfish? You know what I see about Diotrephes here? You get very mouthy. Selfish people are mouthy people. The Bible said that he loveth to have the preeminence, and he received not others. The Bible says, verse 10, Wherefore, if I come, here's what John said about him. He said, I'll remember his deeds which he doeth. What does he do, John? Why are you so upset about what he's doing? Prating against us with malice words. And, and, and not content therewith, and doth, uh, uh, neither doth he himself receive the brethren and forbiddeth them that would and casteth them out of the church. Hey, it's all about running his mouth. You get very mouthy when you get selfish. You go express, hey, you don't care who you hurt. You know, we better be careful. You might hurt somebody with that mouth. And I know there's a lot of responsibility around the church trying to help these young kids, trying to help one another and trying to do what's right. And we all got a stinking flesh that's lost and we got a new man inside of us though that makes us without excuse. But if we're not careful when we get to walking in this flesh and getting to think it's all about us. You know why you get to grumbling and complaining? Because somebody hurt your feelings. You're going to get mouthy because somebody said something about your children. Because some other child said something about your child. And I've seen it happen in church. People leave church over that kind of stuff. Well, somebody hurt my youngest feeling. You know why they hurt your youngest feeling and you left? Because it was all about you and your youngin. It wasn't about Christ. It wasn't like your youngin ain't never hurt nobody's feelings. We, you know, ain't like your youngin ain't never done something they shouldn't have done. All the youngins, all of us have done something wrong before. We all got in the flesh and been wrong, amen. Had to be willing to humble yourself and get back in your place. When you get selfish like that and you get mouthy and you get to run in your mouth, hey, you watch somebody, amen. Hey, when they get mouthy, they just a step away from getting out of church. And they grumbling about everything. And they always got something to grumble about. Instead of uh, uplifting the book and uplifting the brethren, you know, and, and trying to win the laws, we don't care if anybody goes to hell because we're going to let everybody know how much we're mad. And we don't care if it runs somebody away from the church and it causes them not to want to come back because we're going to let everybody know that our feelings has been hurt. And Diotrephes has got a problem with himself and his mouth, mouth is just running off his malicious words. He's just ill and hateful words. Just always hateful. Running that mouth, prating the mouth. That's much talk, amen. Just going on and on and on. We don't care if no little kid's listening. 
We don't care if some other brother is going to hear it. We don't care if it's going to cause them never to come to know the Lord or never to come back to church. Because we're going to be right no matter what. Boy, what a testimony to have that you always got to be right. That the attention's got to be on you. That your selfishness is being uh, displayed by the mouth that you run. Do you know what happens when people get sideways with the church? They start trying to justify it in their talk. Before they go out the door, you know what they do? They start running that lip. And they start running that lip about things. They start planting little seeds. You know what? Uh, I don't know if I believe that. Well, you believe it all the time. Why you don't believe it now? Why is it when your you know why is it when your life gets carnal, your beliefs change? And, and, and then you start to have problems with what the church preaches. And you start to have problems with what, what the brethren say. You didn't have no problem before. It's just the devil giving you a little tool out there to bait you up, to get you sideways with God's people and get it all about you so when you go out, you can justify your actions. You got a testimony. You know what, you know what, you know what, you know what his problem was? He had a selfish problem. His selfish problem was overrun by his mouth and his wicked living. The Bible, in the context, when he speaks of Diotrephes about running his mouth and being a mouthy individual, and by the way, John said, hey, when I see him, I'll let him know. We'll call him out. And God forbid you get called out for being mouthy. You know why he was mouthy? Because he was selfish. You know why he was selfish? Because he was living wicked. He said in verse number 3, Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth uh, good is of God, but he that doeth evil has not seen God. There's something going on here with this guy that he's got a problem with his mouth, and he's got a problem with his self, because he's got a problem with dabbling in things he's got no business in. Kind of kind of all hand in hand go together when you get like that. Most of the time when somebody gets sideways with the church and the testimony of people that's just trying to preach the truth and trying to get the gospel around the world, trying to love the brother and the man who ain't who ain't kind of got sideways at one way or another, but it seems like we start justifying our wickedness. We ain't living right, and we ain't talking right, and we ain't doing right, but everybody else is wrong. And Diotrephes, he didn't care who he tore up on the way out. Well, I mean, a lot of people that got caught up in wickedness, say, man, it tore up a lot of stuff. And when they begin to tear it up, they begin to run their mouth, because you've got to run that mouth to make it justified in your actions. Somehow we try to talk ourselves into what we're doing is right. But we never talk like that until we got selfish and got in sin. You ever thought that that selfish spirit and that sinful thing that you're playing around with is beginning to affect your spirit and your way of thinking? You're no longer walking in the spirit. You're walking in the flesh, and that flesh has been dictated by that wicked spirit, and that wicked spirit's beginning to come out of your mouth. It's seen in your actions, but you know what? You see everybody else is wrong. Do you know what? Before you got into that wickedness you was doing, them people that you began to make accusations about, they were doing that same thing when you wasn't doing wrong. It's amazing how you could overlook some of the faults of the brethren because we all got them, you know. If you're right with God and you're loving God, you realize we all got faults and you just kind of bear one another's burden and put up with everybody. You know, sometimes you've got to put up with people. And you don't have no problem putting up with them until you're not doing right. And then when you get out there in that extreme way of living, you've got to just, you know, ah, you know. And he's got a problem. His problem is sin. Somebody said this, an e evil is a common weed that grows everywhere. Man, you got to fertilize it. Evil just grows up like a weed. You ever planted a garden, those weeds, man, how'd they get there? And you go out there in your yard and you try to plant some grass seed, and man, weeds, they, they just common. They just blow up everywhere. Somebody said evil is a common weed that grows up everywhere, but goodness is a flower that grows in few gardens. That's what he said in verse number three, amen. Hey, follow that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil have not seen God. That evil is just a weed growing up, but hey, that, to have some goodness and godliness in your life, it's going to just be in a few gardens. You've got to, have to nurture it, and you've got to fertilize it, and you've got to keep the weeds out so you can get something done for God. What's growing in your garden? Do you know what? You know what I realize? Listen to this. You better stay away from people, places, and things that causes you to think less of holiness, the house of God, and God himself. 
I'll say that again. You better stay away from people. I don't care who they are. If those people cause you to think less of where you go to church, they are no good for your life. If the people you hang around with cause you to think less of living holy, they are no good for your life. They're like a weed that's going to choke the flower of goodness out of your soul. Amen. Amen. You better stay away from those people that, give you to, that cause you to think less of God, God's place of worship, God's people, and holiness. You better stay away from it. You better stay away from the places that affect you like that. Do you know it's people and places that thing that begin to affect our spirit? And when they begin to affect our spirit, something, things going places we've got no business going and hanging around people you got no business hanging around and doing things you got no business doing, they begin to affect the way you, your spirit works. And when your spirit gets affected, it begins to affect the way you think. And then you're like diatrophies. It's a oh, woe is me and you hate everything. You better stay away from if, if you go around people that talk bad about where you go to church, you better get away from those people. Because if you're not careful, you're going to start thinking bad about church. That's why the Bible says, come ye out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. You better get away from some of that junk. If it, get, if it begins to think, affect the way you think about living holy and begins to influence you to do wrong, you better stay away from those kind of people. Those people that tell those nasty jokes and do those nasty things and play around with nasty stuff, you better stay away from that stuff. It's going to affect the way you think and live. The, the atrophies, boy, he had a problem with his seven. He had a problem with sin. And it affected his life. Stay away from those things that, are, that will affect holiness in God's house and God himself in your life. You know what the Bible says about things like that? You better withdraw yourself away from it. The Archibes would have been good to withdraw himself away from that and get back if there was a time in his life, whether he was saved or not, I don't know. But there should have been a time in his life if he was in that church, that was a time he loved that church. And he loved the people of that church. And he loved the work of the church. And he loved the book that was preached at that church. But for some reason, now it's all about him. Well, you got Gaius and Demetrius over here loving the work of God and loving the people of God and loving the things of God. But the Archerfees is on the opposite side of the spectrum. How is it at one time in your life you could be so in love with the things of God to turn out where you hate every bit of it? How does that happen? You've been influenced. Something's influenced you. Something's influenced you. If the preacher's still preaching the book, and God's people are still doing the same thing they've always done, yes, you can pick and choose if you want and find faults in every one of us. There is nobody perfect in this world except the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm not justifying living wicked. Man, we ought to strive to live as holy as we can for God. I mean, that ought to be our goal in life. But you know what? When you get sideways with God and get full of yourself, you're going to nitpick every little thing. And if the truth be told, most of those things were there the whole time. But they never bothered you that you got living wicked. You better withdraw yourself from it. The Bible speaks about that. Look in, look in 1 Timothy chapter number 5, 6. 1 Timothy 6. What's your testimony? Is it one that loves the church and loves the things of God, or is it one that's against it? Well, one thing I'd hate to be stand before God one day for is, is hurting the church. 1 Timothy 6, in verse number 5, the Bible says, perverse disputing. Look, look just, just go back here. He says, uh, in verse 3, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which uh, is according to godliness. You know what happens? He's like Diotrephes. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strifes, railings, evil surmisings. <laughs> you know, they, they got all these questions. Why are you questioning everything about God? Why does somebody begin to question things about the doctrine of the church? I mean, it ain't like you really want to know the truth. You know what I mean? You're just trying to justify what's going on in your mind. And what's happened, the truth be told, you've been listening to others that are not right with God, and when you get together, you begin to talk about things, and here's what people begin to do. They begin to nitpick the church. Well, why does the church do this? Well, you had no problem with the way the church did it all your life when you was living right. 
But now you're questioning the church. What's going on in your life? Amen. I'm telling you, if you're not careful, you're going to be like the archivist and you're going to tell them something God's trying to do. I mean, how many of us just pray for our lost love? You know what? You know why a lot of, you, this is, this is a, a, a hard pill to swallow, but you know why a lot of our loved ones are going to hell? Because of what they see in our lives. I don't want them to go to hell and we save them going to heaven, but man, we don't care how we run our mouths. We don't care what we do when they're around. Listen to every bit of that. And in the back of their mind, they're thinking, why in the world will I want anything to do with your God and your church? When all you do is speak evil about it. You got a testimony one way or another. Those people know whether you love the book and love the brethren and love the blessed hope or you love yourself. And if you let people talk long enough, you'll find out exactly what they love. And they just going about and doting about these questions and strife of words, perverse disputings of men, corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth. Supposing that gain is godliness... You know what the Bible says? From such withdraw it thyself. You better get away from them. You better, if they're influencing the way you think about holiness, you better get away from them. If they're affecting the way you think about the house of God, you better get away from them. If they're affecting them by the way you think about God himself, you better get away from them. They ain't good for you. Amen. And you say, but I, you know, I can't just cut them off. You better cut them off or you wind up with them. And people are being influenced by these little things that people are throwing out. You know what? You know what? You know what's sad? You can tell when somebody gets like that. Their spirit be- tells on them. Even Brother Ted talking about that body, soul, and spirit. You know what? Some, sometimes before you ever meet that body, you meet that spirit they got. You can tell when people got out, are, are out with you, their spirit starts to tell on them. And their spirit starts to affect their countenance, and they can't look at you with that glow no more. They kind of look at you with a little shame. What happened? Paul said, you know what he said to the Galatian church? Who had bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Why are you, why are you sideways with God's house? Why you got a problem with the preacher now? Why you got a problem with some of God's people? You say, preacher, you know something? Yeah, I know some stuff, but there's some stuff I do not know. But you know what I do know? God knows. And who would have thought maybe God's maybe just kind of you know, ringing your bell saying you better be careful. You better withdraw yourself. You better stop giving ear to that kind of stuff because it's going to start affecting the way you think. He said you better get away. Look in 1, Timothy, uh, Thess- 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. You better withdraw you better back up. Those people get affecting. Listen to me. If those people are affecting your holiness, you better get away from them. If they're affecting your attitude to the house of God, you better get away from them. You know what, you know what God did over there to Cor? You know what Cor got over there doing? He got to run in his mouth about God and who God had in control. And he got, you know, Cor didn't have no problem until he got all by himself. And now he got a problem with Moses. Now, all Moses tried to do is just try to take care of him and lead his children the right path and give them the word of God and give them the commandments of God. But now you got a problem with Moses. Run him out by Moses. You know what God did? He opened up a hole and swallowed him. You better withdraw yourself from that kind of crowd. You know what, you know, you know what, you know what so many people should have did? You better get away from Korah. You're going to go down with him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6, the Bible says, But now when T- uh, Tim- Timotheus, or Timotheus, uh, Timotheus came from uh, you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye uh, have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as also to see you. Got a desire there. Want to see you. Amen. That ain't the verse I'm looking for. Look in chapter 3. In 2 Thessalonians, maybe it is. Yes, sorry. But man, ain't it amazing how one time they wanted to see him? <laughs> and it goes with the message anyhow, don't it? You know what he says in 2 Thessalonians? It's a scribal area, amen. But I can fix it. I wrote it the first time. Chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians, verse 6, he says, Now we commend you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye would draw yourselves from every brother 
that walketh disorderly and not unto the traditions which ye have received of us. You better get away from them. You better withdraw yourself. Look in Romans chapter 16. You know these verses, but maybe you need to see them. Romans 16. You better withdraw yourself. They're affecting you in an evil way. They're going to pull you away from God. You know what I found out when people do wrong? A lot of things, but you know what? They get sideways with people to justify their actions. And they're like the prodigal. And the prodigal says, give me what's rightfully mine. I don't like my daddy's rules. And he goes out there and he lives like hell. And probably how he's out there, he's talking about the old man he had out the house that had all those rules, and I'm glad to be out with you boys partying and doing my thing. He just was just too, he was just too hard on us. And now I'm doing my own thing, and he's running his mouth about his daddy. Give me what's rightfully mine. But you know what happens when he comes to his cell? He says, I'm going back to daddy. You know what I know happens when people get right, uh, sideways with God, they get sideways with the church, and they run their mouth about church and everything that goes on, but when they get right and repent, they'll come right back and let you know they were wrong. You know what I say about that? When they talk like that, just let it go. Don't let it get you sideways with them. Like old brother Jason, you say, don't sell the farm, Father, because one day the son might come home, and you just be there waiting for them and love on them and help them get back, because when they get them back to their senses, they're going to realize you weren't the problem, they were the problem. But now, now you're the problem. That's how it works always. But when they repent and come back, they always eat crow. And then they admit that hey, it wasn't the church, it wasn't the preacher, it wasn't the brothers and sisters in Christ, it was me. And then they want, to, they want you to, they want to apologize to you. But when you're sideways, it ain't, it ain't you, it's the church, it's everybody else. You know what the Bible says when people get like that? You better withdraw yourself away from them. Romans 16, uh, look in verse number uh, 17. He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. And what? Avoid them. You better avoid them. They got problems with the doctrine of the church. They ain't got, they just, they just ain't living right and they're trying to justify everything they do. You know what the Bible says? Avoid them. He says, verse, why? Verse 18, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. That was the atrophies' problem. It was him. He's serving himself. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. You know, you get like that, you know how to whisper things to make it look like everything's all right. Well, we just care about everybody and they don't. Now you just care about yourself. The Atrophies didn't care about the church. He cared about himself. That's why he tore it up. The Bible says to withdraw from them. The Bible says to avoid them because they cause divisions is all they do. They put you at all with one another. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, to not keep company with them. Look at this one. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at 1 Corinthians 5. First Corinthians chapter 5 talks about that fornication that's in the church that's not even much named among the Gentiles, how wicked it was, that a man should have his father's wife. I mean, it was just bad. And they had to run him off. They had to turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Man, they couldn't put up with that mess. It just wasn't right. You got no business fornicating in the church and living like hell and bringing a reproach and testimony against the church. And they just had to get rid of him. Purge out that leaven. Get rid of that wickedness. He said in verse number, he, look what he said. He said in verse number nine, I wrote unto you in an epistle. He said, I've already told you. I wrote into you an epistle, not the company with fornicators. You got no business hanging around with a bunch of fornicators. Because that wicked life's going to affect your life. You know, come out from among the stinking wicked world. As a child of God, you know you got no business hanging out with worldly people that don't know God. No child of God's got any business having friends that don't know God. 
They're going to influence you in the wrong way. He said, I wrote unto you about that. You already know that. Look what he says in verse number 10. Yet not altogether with fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you. He said, I wrote unto you not to keep company with fornicators. Stay away from the world. They're lost. They don't know God. They don't think right. They're going to hurt the way you live. He said, but now I'm writing unto you with something else. You see that? Look, but now I've written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator. He said, stay away from fornicators that don't know God. They're going to hurt your life. Then he says, if a man says he's a brother, if he's saved and he's in fornication, stay away from him also. He ain't no good for you just like that lost man ain't no good for you. When you get a child of God that ain't doing right, they are no good for your life. Not only forsake the world because you know they're going to influence you wrong. People that are not right with God that say they're saved, they're going to hurt your life. That's what he said. He said, if any man be called a brother, be a fornicator or a covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner from such a one, know not to eat. You better get away from them. You know what he said in 1 Corinthians 15, 33? He says, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. You better stay away from people that love wickedness and they have a problem with the church or you're going to soon be in the same boat with them. You begin to think like them. You begin to do what they do. And your testimony begins to be sour. People influence you wrong. Look back in 3 John. There's two testimonies given to this, in this little book that John wrote. And there was one that loved God, a testimony that loved the book and loved the brethren and loved the blessed hope, and one over here that just loved his self. If we was to sit down and write a book today addressed to the beloved at Hopewell Independent Baptist Church and the Holy Spirit of God began to write down brothers and sisters in Christ, what would he write down about your testimony? Would it be one that loved the book and loved the blessed hope and loved the brother? Or would it be one that just loved their self and are out to destroy. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.